What else do we do primarily with property tax? Is education. So the last area of substantial state spending that we haven't talked about at all, and by state spending I mean state government spending, is education. It's, I think, in most people's minds, among the very most important things that state and local government do. Uh, and it's where, of course, a substantial amount of the funds go, both because it's so important and because it's expensive and difficult. So what does this pie chart tell us? Well, first of all, on the bottom right, it tells us that we spend, uh, in average, $13,124 per pupil in Illinois, which ranks us 18th. So that's um, a little above the median, not enormously so, and that's even before you account for the fact that we're a pretty rich state. So, you know, it's, it's not, a, not an enormously high number, moderately high at most. But then if you break that down into the different sources of funds, you see that the feds provide $1,800 per kid, which ranks in 10th. The state provides $4,100 per kid, which ranks the state 39th. And just remember, that's before we've adjusted for prosperity, for per capita income or anything. And the, the local property taxpayer provides $7,100 per kid, which ranks 10th. And then if you look at how those different slices make up a part of the pie, you find that the local makes up in the year that was measured, uh, fiscal year 2010, uh, over 54% of the pie, which ranks us sixth in the country for uh, reliance upon local property tax for education funds. So that's interesting. We fund education reasonably well, though not enormously well. We do it in a way that's heavily reliant upon local funds. That drives up property tax, as we've already seen. It also means that because local ability to pay varies enormously across the state, you wind up with pretty substantial inequity across the state. In fact, I was at a presentation earlier today that demonstrated uh, that our inequity is really among the very highest. Uh, if you look at the way education funds are distributed across the state, and the question, of course, becomes how do you look for indications of the consequence of that phenomenon on the outcome level? So here's something we found pretty interesting. This is the NAEP test, which are a kind of standard national test. It's a fairly old test. It's from 2009. But again, we wanted to make sure we were using data that we could find apples to apples across all the states and, and adequately report it. So we went back to 2009. And what this, this, this test, this, these graphs just show um, for the basic, proficient, and advanced level, how well do we rank at, at achieving those levels? The dark blue is eighth grade reading, the light blue is eighth grade math, the chartreuse is fourth grade math, and the sort of pale yellowish thing is fourth grade reading. And I wouldn't obsess too much about the shape of the lines, but the point that I want to make is the lines are all going up, up and to the right. The lines are all going up and to the right, indicating that we're frankly not so hot at, basic, at the basic numbers. And, and those of you who have seen the uh, advanced Illinois report card that was released a few days ago see this. We're not so hard at, we're not so hot at these basic numbers. And the further along the, the road from basic to advanced you get, the more successful you find that we are at meeting these standards. And that's, really what you might expect from a situation where there's an inequity of inputs that's producing on the back end a world where we're pretty, we're pretty great at, you know, for example, how many of our fourth grade reading students meet the advanced level, but we're, we're really struggling at the basic level. There's a, there's a divide emerging. And you'll see a bit more of that in this slide that shows something really quite interesting. We're going to look by different age cohorts. We're going to look by different age cohorts at different levels of educational attainment. The number you're going to see on the right-hand side of the slide is the number of people who have at least a bachelor's degree. The number on the left-hand slide is the people who have less than a high school degree. And the middle is the people in between, people who do not have a, a BA, but they have a high school degree, maybe they have a, an associate's degree, maybe they went to some college and didn't complete any certificate. And so for the first line, the 65-plus cohort, you just see a downward sloping line, which is essentially the worst picture you could possibly have. It says the, the more advanced the population you're looking at, the worse we do. We're, we've got a lot of people over 65 without a high school degree, 
fewer who have a high school degree but not a bachelor's, and even fewer who have a bachelor's. But now look at the next age cohort, 45 to 64. You see this, this V-shape start to emerge, where we do pretty well at having bachelor's, and pretty well, if you can call it that, at having people without a high school degree, but that in-between level is weaker. And if you keep on scrolling down at younger cohorts, and the next one, and the next one, it becomes more acute until if you look at the 18 to 24 co cohort, we're phenomenal at having 18 to 24 year olds with a bachelor's degree. And, and 24 is young, right? That, those are the people who finish high school on time, go right to college and get their four year degree on time, which is, which is a great model. You wanna be good at that. But then somehow we're falling further and further behind at that intermediate level, the associate's degree, the community college and into the workforce, the uh, finishing your high school degree and going into the workforce. And so you see, as time elapses, this expanding polarization in our population, in our workforce, and so the question then becomes, what does that mean for our economy?